Well, welcome to our webinar on open banking, everyone. My name is Will Shaw. I'm a partner at Baskin in Toronto, and I'm one of the co-leaders of our emerging technology practice here. I just want to thank you at the outset for joining us. We're really thrilled to have you here, albeit virtually. You know, we'll look forward to hosting you in person, hopefully in the not too distant future as well. Before we begin, a few housekeeping notes, and then I'll introduce the speakers. Um, if you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the chat box beside the video. We have set aside time for questions and we'll do our best to answer all the questions we can. If you require technical support, please click the text, text support link, which is located under the question chat box. And if you're looking for a copy of the materials, the presenter bios from today's webinar can be accessed under the materials button in the video player. So now on to our, on to our esteemed speakers. The first up is Senator Colin Deacon. Senator Deacon was appointed to represent Nova Scotia in the Senate of Canada in June, 2018. He's a lifelong entrepreneur. He's passionate about building an inclusive and resilient economy. And most recently, Senator Deacon's been focused on harnessing the digital economy, improving Canada's public and private sector competitiveness and addressing climate change. Next is Peggy Vandeplash. Peggy's the managing partner at Roar Growth and a board member at Invest in Canada, Impact Finance, Front Funder and Hacker Gal. Peggy spent close to 20 years in the IT and financial services industries as an executive, an investor, an entrepreneur. Uh, she's been leading financial institutions as well as a software and, and IT services companies. As a senior advisor, Peggy's currently, currently helping companies in the financial services and fintech space realize their growth potential by uncovering and unlocking value. Our next panelist is Ben Harrison. Ben is a partner and the head of partnerships and policy at Portage Ventures. Prior to joining Portage in 2018, Ben had spent more than 15 years at Canada Life in senior level strategy uh, positions, product development and marketing, as well uh, as, well as um, being the head of innovation for Canada. As head of partnerships, Ben's team works with investors to help them execute on their strategic objectives through a combination of commercial partnerships with the fund's portfolio companies and, and relevant and differentiated insights into the trends shaping the fintech sector. Ben also leads Portage's government affairs mandate and has helped to position the organization as a leading voice for pro-competition and innovation. I think Will accidentally just dropped off there. Hi, everyone. My name is Kate. I'm actually going to be moderating this panel today. So I'm going to take over for Will, who I believe is probably frozen right now um, with some connectivity issues. So I'm not quite sure where he dropped off speaking about Ben, unfortunately, but- You, you um, don't need to read any more of my bio, please. That's perfect. Okay. <laughs> Great. Get going. Great. Uh, so my name is Kate. I'm going to be moderating this panel today. Uh, lovely to have you all here with me. I am with Baskin and I work as a business advisor within our emerging technology companies group. My job really circulates around working within the ecosystem and open banking as well as fintech has been something that has been a deep interest of mine for many years. So we have a lot to get into this afternoon. So why don't we just go ahead and jump right into it. As Will mentioned, we will be taking Q&A at the end. So please feel free to put your questions into the chat and we can kind of jump off from there. So our first question is going to be quite an easy one. What is open banking? Why is it important? And why should we care about this as Canadians? I can, I can start it. It might sound easy. I'm not sure it is. Um, at the highest level, I mean, open banking is a framework wherein banks provide third parties access to a customer's information, obviously with their consent and ideally uh, as securely as possible. Uh, in order for those third parties or those banks to provide new products or services and I think increase the level of transparency within, um, uh, within those, those interactions today. In, in terms of why, it is, why is it important, I think, again, at the highest level, it, it does a few things. It helps people make better decisions by understanding more data. Uh, understanding uh, uh, the the types of products and services that I'm using, I can make better decisions, and often it can simplify the decisions that I need to make. Uh, I, I think it it forces uh, incumbents to innovate and and be more competitive, in part because the barriers to entry in order to engage with consumers lowers, and 
I think, you know, why should uh, Canadians care? I, I think the answer, that, that one is, in my mind, at least more simple. I think it solves the fundamental problem we have with financial services today, which is around this idea of customer engagement. You know, the, the lack of engagement that we have, and, and not just financial literacy, but I think the challenges that people have engaging with financial services companies and the products and services that are available is really difficult. There, there are a few industries with sort of as much asymmetrical in, information between the two parties as there is in financial services. And so anything that can be done to simplify that and help people make better decisions is, is a good thing. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop with one, one last point, which, which I think is, um, I think it's worth noting that, that you know, in, in other markets, it's actually been this customer engagement piece that has driven the decision to implement open banking that this presents such a challenge. Uh, and for so long, consumers have struggled with making the right financial choices that, that, that this type of program, this framework needed to be implemented. And, and I think you know, that is why it is so critical we move on this file. Really well put, Ben. And I think, you know, you summed it up very well for the audience of what open banking is and why it's important. So, you know, we've already seen open banking delayed due to COVID, which is completely understandable. But where do you all think this timeline has been pushed to and how can we expedite the process so we don't fall further behind other countries? Can we dive in on that one, Kate? Sure. I'll, uh, um, it, it, we're already past the point of falling behind other countries and uh, falling behind other major competitors globally. So we, the best we can hope for now is to become a fast follower. And it's important, we've got to keep our banking system competitive, globally competitive. Our financial sector has to be a sector that's the foundation of our economy. And if it isn't globally competitive in terms of the services it can offer, the insights it can offer, the value it can deliver to customers, the cost efficiency of the, of the businesses, our whole economy gets dragged down. And at this point, we are not keeping up and the, and the delay has been regulatory change. Now, we're, it's great to see our new finance minister reprioritize the file. Um, it, it had not been a priority of the previous finance minister at all. And so I am hopeful that, that uh, we are in a position where we can start to catch up, but it still will take time. And I'll give you an example. The Retail Payments Oversight Framework legislation has been drafted and in Finance Canada for two years, ready to be implemented. It has not made it into a budget. This is a framework that allows new, uh, new payments providers, systems providers to be part of our, our financial system in a formal way and, and part of our regulatory oversight. And that, from my standpoint, that lack of competition, it stifles innovation and it disproportionately negatively affects marginalized Canadians and, and, and underbanked and, and uh, our, our more vulnerable Canadians because they pay a higher cost on every level. Those of us who are fortunate enough to be able to pay off our Visa cards or, or a MasterCard or other credit cards every month, we're the ones who benefit from the fact that others can't because we get reward points and other things that they're actually paying for, marginalized Canadians. So this is a regressive uh, regulata regulatory environment that we're living in. And that's, so we've got to start moving. And at this point, all we can hope is to potentially become a fast follower, but it does worry me increasingly that we're not taking action. I think those are great points, Senator Deacon. Anything else to add, Ben, Peggy? Well, I'll, I'll dig a bit more on, on uh, Senator Deacon's point regarding the underbanked and the unbanked, but, uh, you know, I, I absolutely agree that there is a, a high cost that is being paid by Canadian due to the lack of open banking regulation, which I don't think is really realized. Um, and I'm not saying that to be uh, derogative. I don't think people have seen the two, three, five derivatives of not having these regulations. For sure, for sure. And I think it's all very important points, just looking at the underbanked and what is happening in that ecosystem. So I think one of the things that we'd be remiss not to talk about is there's many startups in the fintech ecosystem that are currently relying on something called screenscaping and or APIs to actually make their products work. 
how do you think open banking is going to affect them? And how will the financial, financial institutions potentially work with these startups to ensure that we're building a viable ecosystem for everyone? Okay, so I guess this one's for me. Uh, so thank you, thank you, Kate. Um, so, so first, you know, like, and I, I'm just gonna piggyback on what Ben and, and, and Senator Deacon said previously, but open banking will be a positive uh, for the clients, for the fintech, but also for the financial institutions. And I'll go, go back to that in a minute and, and the overall um, ecosystem. So just um, to give a couple of words on screen scraping, because it might not be something that people know uh, what, what it means. So, so screen scraping is really the, the process uh, for um, a developer, web, web developer of taking the data from a web page. So it's, it's, it's a very, very basic way uh, of working. While an API is like, think about the conduit that is bringing the data in the background. So way more secure. So, so because uh, we still don't have open regulations in Canada and we don't have any, um, I would say, obligations for the financial institutions to put in place API, a lot of the B2C fintechs have no choice than to resort to uh, screen scraping. And this is an issue. It's not just technicalities, once again. Uh, this is an issue because it means that the clients have to give their credentials from their, to this fintech of their financial institutions. And by doing so, they're in breach of their own agreements with their banks. So that's, that's a big challenge. Uh, the second challenge is that now these fintechs have to store the credentials of their clients. So obviously that creates uh, a suboptimal situation. So, so that's something that uh, you need to keep in mind when you're thinking about uh, screen scraping. And, and the third thing, which is a, um, a, a bit more uh, interesting, let's put it that way, is that when financial institutions make changes to their website, and these changes might be done not on purpose or on purpose to avoid screen scraping, uh, these fintechs cannot access the data anymore. So if you are a client of this organization, well, you're going to see break in uh, your, your, your information. So you can imagine client experience, well, you're not happy if you're a client. The fintech is potentially losing clients. They might not be able to get new clients because the experience is not very good. So, so it's, it's the screen scraping and the lack of protocol around APIs prevent our Canadian B2C fintech to actually grow. And that's something that we need to keep in mind because there is an impact on wealth creation and we're gonna discuss that uh, a bit later. So, so open banking regulations would enable to put in place protocol where you have API between your banks, your FinTech, it's safe and secure. The clients have no risk with this data, doesn't have to give his credentials. The, the FinTech doesn't have to have break in services. So it's very important. And uh, when it comes to the FIs, I, I will come back to, to, to Senator Deacon's point and why it's so important for them to actually support the implementation of open banking regulations. So it might not seem obvious Technically, uh, they should be interested in giving a better service to their clients, but also maintain market uh, competition. But I understand they might not uh, see that way. But more importantly is that they're gonna be competing with big tech and they're already competing technically and with foreign institutions. I mean, sure, you can hear to my accent. I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, originally uh, born and raised here and I'm not the only one in, in Canada. So if you're from India, if, if you're from China, well, you might be interested in dealing with financial institutions from your country of origin that have better product and services. So I'll go back to that later, but it's extremely, extremely important actually that we are putting in place this, uh, this regulation. So again, very good for the ecosystem and important for the financial institutions to collaborate with our FinTech in order to, to make it a reality. Maybe it's just worth adding, um, you know, it's interesting that even in markets like the UK that have had open banking in place now for uh, a, a, a few years, you know, screen scraping data aggregation still happens. Um, and so I think this speaks to one of the really important points of whatever the framework we ultimately implement is the scope of the data. 
you know, the UK now is down the path of, of considering open finance. Australia went down that path with the roadmap they put out a couple of years ago. But consumers are, and, and small businesses are so much further ahead in, in this discussion with the data that they're already using today that to, to think too narrowly about screen scraping versus, un, unless we can create a whole bunch, you know, the, the banks and the financial services community is willing and able and ready to create a whole bunch of APIs uh, for not just transactional uh, uh, checking account data, but mortgage data, savings data, wealth, like this is the path that we're clearly on. So I think, you know, what, what the, the fintech community is really looking for is some level of standardization uh, in the approach that's standardization, say some level standardization in the approach that you use clarity on the scope and ideally as broad a scope as possible. And, and knowing that, like we're seeing in other regions, more data will be required. So while we know we're going to have to likely start smaller than we would like, it, we have to have this mindset that we need to be moving quickly down the path of not just open banking, but more broadly open finance. Completely agree, Ben. And I think those are some really good points. And just drawing upon that, I think open banking will also potentially lead to numerous partnership opportunities between the fintechs and the FIs. How can both sides really prepare for this? And how can we ensure there's a clear path for success? Uh, well, we need to know what's happening. <laughs> like it, there, there needs to be clarity sooner than later on what will open banking in Canada look like? How will it be structured? What will the scope of the data be? How will accreditation work? Like the, the, the technical aspect of all of this is relative, relatively straightforward. It's, I think, quite easy for the fintechs. I think it's more difficult for the banks who need to open up this data. But, you know, Peggy, Peggy made a point about some of the things that aren't being discussed today. And, and, and I think one of the biggest is the impact that this indecision uh, and lack of direction forward will have on what is a really exciting fast growing and maturing fintech community. Like we're, we're, this isn't five years ago where, where people were trying to figure out will some of these direct to consumer businesses succeed and what will they look like? You know, we're in a world now where the likes of Wellsimple and Coho and Borowell and Mogo and all of these Neo, like all of these companies are creating viable, competitive, stand up, standalone businesses. And the lack of clarity in their decision-making process in order to decide what do I do next, how do I build my business, is really difficult. You know, the fact that they have to be considering at this stage, some of them, do I do I get a bank license? Do I not get a bank license? Like the issues with ARPOF and access to the real-time rail, these are all really big issues. So I, you know, I, I think the partnerships that that can happen today are are going to happen. I think you know the senator's been quite quite um, clear on this point that business models are changing. I, I think there's there's sparks of like ecosystem versus sort of moat mentality with uh, the the broader financial services community, and no doubt there will continue to be a whole bunch of fintechs who will exist to work with and enable the 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 the, the traditional FIs, and that's great. The, those those organizations need to stay competitive. I think the point that we really need to be more focused on is what this. Um, uh, lack of clarity will do to those who are actually going to push those organizations even more. And if, if I can jump on that, one of the things we need to keep in mind is also B2C and B2B fintech. You know, like you have B2B fintech that obviously per definition work with banks, their, their clients. Uh, yeah, we're focusing more on, on, on B2C, obviously. Um, a lot of partnership have been happening in Canada, actually, between B2C fintechs and, and banks. Um, and you are asking, how oh, can we, uh, how can we uh, make them more successful? And I think that's probably what I've seen as, as an issue. And a few years back, I was uh, leading innovation for, for a large Canadian bank. It's the, you know, I speak French, you speak English, and how oh, can we, uh, if we don't have a translator, how do we work together? And the expectations of the banks are so high and they don't necessarily understand they're working with a 10, 15 person shop. And when you're asking a startup to go from one executive meeting to another executive meeting, 
well, as a bank, it doesn't matter. You have uh, 45,000 employees. You can bring them along for a long time. Uh, if you're a 10 person company, you cannot do that. So actually I have some, but I won't name B2C FinTech who are telling me, well, I partner with bank X, Y, Z. And had I known, I would have never done that because it costed me a tremendous amount of money and uh, time. And I never get the return on that because it's nice to partner, but if the bank doesn't market your products or your service to their clients, who cares? So there is, there is a lot of work that needs to be done on both sides of the equation uh, to make that happen in good condition, regardless of open banking. That's a fantastic point, Peggy. And I think that is a really good conversation that should be happening between the FIs and the startups. What does success look like and how do you make it viable for both parties? So when we think about open banking, there's a big risk of inaction as well. If we don't act, then we're actually potentially halting the pace of innovation and creating further barriers for the tech ecosystem. How can we really mitigate this risk and what are the steps that need to be taken? Uh, Kate, I just say very simply that the best way to mitigate the risk uh, of inaction is starting to act and sending very clear signals uh, on, at the most senior levels of government. Um, right now, Bill C-11, the, uh, uh, the new privacy legislation that has been proposed, um, it, at this, it, it's, it's not getting prioritized in the House of Commons. There's no political party that sees uh, our adoption of global standards in terms of data portability and, and other, other fundamental changes as being a priority in an increasingly digital world. I mean, digitization is accelerated by a decade in 10 months, sort of, you know, the, the, the sort of scale that's spoken about. If we don't understand the priority of, of, of uh, upgrading our digital infrastructure in this country now, it's very worrisome. For, from my standpoint. So clear signals from the most senior levels of government that this is the road we're moving down and you can count on it. And we're gonna be doing everything necessary to enable competition in our financial services industry for the benefit of banks, for the benefit of innovative enterprises and the benefit of consumers. And this is really needed by our banks because for the most part, they have not kept up in their own digital infrastructure. Their digital infrastructure has not been prioritized. And, and you know, our focus on quarterly results has not served them well in terms of, of the state that they are currently in. Our government, uh, governments across Canada and our financial institutions have, have antiquated digital infrastructure. We are very lucky as Canadians that CRA actually was keeping up to a certain degree and we were able to deliver the CERB through the CRA. But if, if it wasn't for that, I can't even begin to imagine when this, the CERB actually would have reached the bank accounts of Canadians at the beginning of this pandemic. And we're very fortunate for some really talented folks within the federal government uh, in the in the digital government side who were able to make things happen. But that was that is not because the system is moving. That was because of, of, of a break that we got. We can't keep counting on that in Canada. So for me, I'm, I'm worried about inaction very seriously. Uh, I, I'm worried about uh, if investors like Peggy and Ben uh, start to see greater certainty outside of Canada because they are and an increasing rate and no signal in Canada that that's gonna change, that we're gonna see a migration of, the, of our still relatively small investor base out of this country. And there's already there have been signals of that, that, you know, we've got great talented investors that are moving their, their fintech investments to the UK. I don't blame them to Australia. Um, but so we'll see a migration of investment talent, which is at the core of building an innovation economy. Uh, we're going to see the, the, the migration of technical talent because they're going to get paid more and have bigger opportunities. You know, the, the reality is talent follows opportunity in, 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 in the tech space. If you don't have a good enough opportunity, you're, I'm going to damage my career by joining you. So, you know, we're, we've got to really worry about keeping our AI leadership, which we, we had, but we didn't turn that AI leadership at a, at, a, at, a, at a research and educational level into an economic 
leadership in AI in Canada. We have not done that. And it's because we haven't kept up with the necessary regulatory change to enable the flourishing of an industry that comes in and starts to apply that to deliver customer value. And so these are the things that, that have me concerned. Um, that, that, and if we don't see a really strong signaling from, you know, I am hoping from this government, but I'm also hoping from every single political party to say, this is important. This is central. Canadians may not yet appreciate the value differential that they can get by using a fintech app in combination with their banking data. They may not yet realize that, but we have to, as parliamentarians and as legislators, realize that for them and start to prioritize this issue. Maybe I'll just add um, to follow on a bit on the senator's point is, uh, it's it's not so much in action as the how quickly we move the the pace of our action. You know the reality is it probably goes without saying, but but open banking is already here, right? We just don't have a regulatory framework around it. People are millions of Canadians are are leveraging these services because they add value to their financial lives, and so the 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 risk of not providing uh, clarity and and some of the signals that that. Um, uh, the senator referenced is that you, you start to go down the path of building an open banking framework in a purely market-led environment where I think it's fair to uh, call into question how much individuals or consumers will control their data and be able to make the decisions between sharing information with one organization or another versus the holder of that data making those decisions. Um, and I, I think all, all the FIs um, in Canada understand and are taking steps to, to uh, uh, put in place uh, data sharing capabilities. But in, in a, I think, truly open banking led environment, it's the consumer who's able to make the decision on which organization I'd like to work with with all the right caveats around this is a fit and proper organization. It's been approved or accredited by a, a central body, not, not one bank versus another. And that you're ultimately then creating this whole of market solution where it doesn't really matter where I bank, as long as this entity that I wanna work with is accredited and approved and is running a good business, I should have that choice. And so the further you go down the path of a, a, a market-led solution, I think the greater the risk that you don't end up in, in that space and decisions on the consumer's level are still impacted by the, 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 the primary banking relationship they have. For sure. Very well said, Ben. And I know we're getting some audience questions kind of coming in right now. So just as a reminder, we're going to hold questions to the end, but please keep them coming. Um, some really interesting ones in there for sure. So want to move on to our next question of the panel here. If we think about the economic growth that open banking could potentially bring to Canada, what kind of innovations do you think we'll see with the implementation? And how can we ensure that we are building on a global scale? Thank you, Kate. And, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to, uh, to talk about innovation in that context, because if you look at open banking, it has already been on, ongoing for at least three years in, in the UK and Europe. We're obviously not at the forefront. So it's going to be, again, innovation in the context of, as Ben was mentioning, market-led, but not in the context of global. And that creates a big challenge because when you're looking at creating global solutions that can scale, but that you are actually focusing on your own market because of the regulations, well, but that, that is obviously a, a bit of a, of a contradiction. So... Um, on the bright side, of the dark side, uh, the, the Canadian market is uh, is a very tough market to break in. So uh, a lot of these financial or fintech player you see uh, in the UK and Europe are not necessarily coming to uh, to Canada. And you see Revolut came and which we did, you know, very very shortly after. So so it still leads. 
uh, leave some opportunities for our Canadian entrepreneurs. But again, this is not a, a global perspective from the get-go, and that's that's a challenge. Um, so if I look at um, some of the opportunity that that open banking is going to create. Uh, the beauty is going to be to be able to operate, uh, you know, cheaper and faster. So, uh, and back to uh, Senator Dickens' point, uh, the use cases around underbanked and unbanked now can be enabled because, again, open banking makes things cheaper and faster. So, so you see uh, great opportunities. We already have some business models that are happening in Canada, uh, Ben was mentioning co well, simple. You obviously have um, wellness app, which is where I think we need uh, financial wellness, uh, which is where I think we need more pro wellness is great, but let's stick to finance or so financial wellness, um, where I think we need more uh, progress uh, because for Canadian, it's very important for them to have not only access to financial services that will be cheaper thanks to competition, and that's going to be something that you know benefits the great majority of Canadians, not just you know the people on that line, um, but also the fact that giving them more tools to manage their finance and uh, you know have, have a better way of uh, making financial decisions is going to create great wealth. So, so I think open banking is going to actually help with you know the people who are the most vulnerable uh, and uh, probably the average Canadian, which is extremely important. So again, which is why open banking is, uh, is so, so important and to have the, the, I would say the regulations, the framework around that um, as fast as possible. Fantastic. I think those are some really great thoughts. One thing I'd actually really like to touch upon with this panel is community and ecosystem within this conversation. We're seeing a lot of innovation come from the ground up with community groups such as OBIC, Paytex of Canada, Lentex of Canada, and there's many others. These groups are really helping shape the conversations around this topic and in some instances almost leading them. How can we ensure that they are further involved with building the future infrastructure so that open banking really works for all? Um, uh, so I, I think, so I, and I, I, I'm, you know, our organization is affiliated with a few of these, these groups. And I mean, it's because we need a uh, stronger, more, uh, harmonized voices, uh, to make it clear to government that these are important issues and that we need to act on them. I think it's not always appreciated just uh, and, and Peggy touched on this, um, you know, most fintechs have like 0.3 of a person who can be dedicated to policy work, e even in even in some of the bigger, more mature organizations, right? They don't have teams of 10 people uh, to uh, to dedicate to, you know, uh, five meetings in 10 days at the end of December. It, it's really tough. And so you're seeing this support because these are really important issues. Uh, and, and, you know, if no one is there, then the voice of the, the pay tech and the fintech doesn't get heard. I think it's great that the government has been open and, and, and encouraging uh, and supportive of those voices. Um, but there needs to be action. Uh, these aren't organizations that can, can sustain themselves indefinitely. And so, you know, how, uh, how do we sure, ensure that they continue to be involved? We, we take action, we start to move forward. And uh, if we don't, then they're not gonna be around. And, and that's, you know, a bigger issue, I think, for the ecosystem as a whole. Uh, but that, that is, I, I, to be quite blunt, I think that's the point. And I'd like to build on that if I could, Kate. And, and it's just that to lobby government uh, at, uh, among the banks, you've got, a fraction, you've got a fraction of a percent of a rounding error cost. I mean, it's just for them to have a full-time team working 24 hours a day on regulatory issues related to this. And if we want to have an economy that is keeping up competitively, we have got to make sure that our process for regulatory reform and inclusion 
in 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 terms of the you know moving forward in 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 a in a more competitive economy actually takes into consideration the fact that new entrants do not have the power of incumbents on they don't have the relationships they don't have the the bandwidth they don't have the expertise um and so but they do have an ability to deliver disruptive value to customers and so we've got to find a way as an economy to marry this not just in 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 finance in the, uh, our financial sector and and in the in the broader terms beyond open banking as ben was saying earlier but to much broader uh, on much broader levels we have got to find a way of of uh, of making sure that we have we can include new entrants and incumbents in the process of regulatory reform across our economy because we've got a lot of changes to come as we digitize at an increasingly rapid rate so i think the point he made is just really important i just want to double down on it Yeah, hundred percent. And I think those are some great points. And as somebody that's made a career out of building ecosystems, couldn't agree more, Ben, on that for sure. So we'd like to jump into one of our final questions here before we jump over to audience Q&A. Uh, from the start startup perspective, working with FIs can frequently be cumbersome due to legacy technology and infrastructure. How can we regulate the upkeep of the banking technology and who at the end of the day is responsible for this? I just offer that that we've we've really considered financial regulation as being one of managing money, not the systems that enable the financial institution to know what's going on with with their resources. And the transformation that's occurred since most of their systems were developed is is fundamental. So, you know, I I have to believe that uh, OSFI has got to have a look at this. They have certainly got a survey out in the market right now and are, and are investigating it. But making sure that uh, these, these institutions that Canada has got some tremendous global leaders in our, in our banking system, but making sure that they are in fact making the investments that they need to make for the next generation uh, to make sure that they can keep up uh, competitively and that they are safe and as secure technologically. Uh, we cannot leave that to internal management decision making because the evidence is clear that that doesn't work. And it doesn't work for those within the bank, it doesn't work for their shareholders, it doesn't work for their customers. So that is, from my standpoint, a very important new area, but I am fearful of government re regulation because the process is so slow and cumbersome, we've just been speaking about that. So is, if we can start to look at regulatory change in a different way, who's at the table in a different way to make sure that we help uh, stay globally competitive, that that's our benchmark. Um, you know, yes, we've got, to in, we've got to have Canadian values embedded in our regulations, without a doubt. But if our regulations then are not globally competitive, we've got to start to make some trade-offs and really uh, double down. And if, as, as a country, we have got to worry about the technology infrastructure and at the core of it all, that's our banking system. Really well said. So I'd love to jump into some of the audience Q&A um, and remind everyone, please use the Q&A box down on the bottom of the screen for any questions you might have. So why don't we jump into that now? Uh, so our first question that we got from the audience is, how will open banking affect me as a banking customer? I think we've covered this a little bit. Would love to hear your opinions though. How is this going to affect the average person who's just doing day-to-day -day banking? Well, hopefully choices and, uh, you know, lower pricing. So just that uh, should be uh, enough of, uh, of uh, um, I would say, ex exciting uh, answer for, uh, for the clients. But uh, yeah, no, we discuss about the products, the service, but it's it's really this competition that, uh, that we're lacking, you know, like Canada is an oligopolistic uh, financial services ecosystem. 90% of the assets under management are within the big six. So, you know, we, we need we need more competition. You know, switching accounts is maybe the simplest sort of use case to get your head around um, uh, or products, the, the benefits for the individual consumer. If you've struggled with, you know, fees or uh, service, there's just so much inertia built into our system. It's 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 inevitable that most Canadians just stay with their primary bank account. 
the one that they set up when they're you know, 10 or 11 years old, whenever that is. Um, if it were easier and more seamless to make those changes, uh, I think you would open up uh, to Peggy's point, competition in the marketplace, which competition is ultimately what drives you know uh, everything for uh, for the market. So I think that that's one really simple example to uh, to highlight. And I I build on just the, the 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 variety of services that will come to that are simply not available for the most part to consumers today. You ask a Canadian what a fintech is, they don't know. They have no, they have no idea what a fintech is. They know what a bank is. Um, but what they do appreciate is when they start to if if you're a marginalized Canadian who doesn't know how to improve your your uh, credit score and is constantly getting to the end of the month not having quite enough money and not able to budget as well as you'd like, there, there's an app for that. <laughs> there's a lot of apps for that that can, can make your life a lot easier and, and give you a greater sense of control over your financial assets and the fact that you are moving towards however limited a starting point you begin at, that you're moving towards something better. And it's doing a lot of that work for you. So the financial literacy improvement that can occur by having a tool that helps to demystify some of these elements and to help you organize, if you're not an organized person, uh, your finances, absolutely crucial. As someone who's built businesses, I can assure you that I did not start those small businesses to um, take on the administrative burden associated with running them. Never. That wasn't what I wanted to do. That was the devil that I had to carry on my back as I did what I wanted to do. And the team did what we wanted to do. Well, there's an app for that. <laughs> there's for those who are, who are, um, you know, have uh, tenuous and, and, and changing income levels. You can have your pay, you know, you can there'll be an app that guarantee or that monitors that. And the UK, it's a great service that they've got that you pay a monthly fee and, and you can in the slow months draw down uh, at a very cost efficient rate, something that help you get through to the, to the next good month versus the current alternative in our system is payday lenders. So the opportunities are massive and especially those at the marginalized end of the spectrum. Uh, those who, who cannot borrow money for an intent, I mean, as, a, as when I went to the bank to borrow money, I could borrow as much as I, I left on deposit at the bank. That was, that was how I, you know, that's how my banking system goes. That's how I got a credit card for my, my tech startup was I had to put money on deposit. You know, it, it, the, there, there are companies out there that want to lend money to those who deal in intangibles because they understand how to, to evaluate risk differently. Fintech lenders evaluate risk differently using different metrics than the traditional lender sues. And as a result, the, the US Fed has found that, that they identify invisible prime borrowers from within what is deemed to be an uncreditworthy population. So I'll stop because I can just go on and on and on. But the, the opportunity for those who are underbanked and don't know it is massive. Yeah, Senator Deacon's also bringing up an important point, which we haven't really touched on. Maybe two things. One, one is at the SME market. You know, the last point about fintech lending and um, leveraging data to make lending decisions that would otherwise, in traditional models, result in likely a no. Uh, you're you're seeing massive uh, uh, uptake and benefit from SMEs in particular in the regions where open banking has been implemented, um, and. We, we know in Canada, based on a number of reports, we're not great at lending to small business. And so there's a huge opportunity and upside there. The other thing we're not talking about, um, and it's frustrating because um, the, 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 the element of open banking that really turns insight into action is being able to make decisions around payment and, and flow of money and who gets to move that money. It's referred to as payment initiation uh, or write access. We talk about data being read access. You know, all the really exciting use cases. And again, like what takes the insight to action is actually the payment initiation piece. And um, you know, we as a country are not really discussing payment, discussing payment initiation in our in our consultation process, which I think two years ago would have been fine. 
the fact that we're two years further in this conversation, we're still not really talking about it is only going to become a bigger issue. And I hope, I hope that we can make some progress on, on RPOF uh, and um, the changes that are needed to the Payments Canada Act in the short term. And that then payment initiation can be a really quick follow on to uh, what will hopefully be a broader implementation of open banking in the not too distant future. Great points, everyone. So I think we have time for probably about one or two more questions and I'm going to sort of put some together because I'm seeing a lot of questions just about, you know, how can we be heard? How does it apply to smaller incumbents such as credit unions? And then, you know, Bill C-11, it seems to have some challenges now and without it, it's going to be very difficult to move forward. So with your, with that in mind, you know, how can we start pushing forward and how can we speed up the process from both the startup as well as the FI's perspective? I'd love to dive in just on the credit unions for a second because I live in a rural community uh, from Atlantic Canada and, 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 and based in Atlantic Canada and, and credit unions play a very big role uh, in our financial system. And unless our provinces embrace this change as well in the regulatory structure that's governing our credit unions or we get federal credit union legislation that they can seamlessly adopt if they'd like, um, as uh, by their choice, by the unions, credit unions members' choice, um, I, I feel that they're going to be in a, an increasingly challenging position because they do not have equal access to many uh, relative to the big banks in terms of cost, the cost and service access to many of the fun, foundational payment services. Um, they, they, we've got to make sure they stay competitive and that they can serve entrepreneurs and and individuals in their communities as well as Canadians in in, in Toronto. And the, the opportunity is tremendous for them. I've spent a lot of time chatting with credit unions. I'm a huge believer that that our credit unions should become big adopters of of um, of of tech of the B two B side that that Peggy was speaking about earlier. Uh, that that bringing in the services of fintechs into their their businesses and and bundling as part of their own services. Uh, there's a tremendous opportunity there to serve rural and remote and, and and other communities in Canada through the credit unions. I'm not saying they're, of course, there's great major credit unions that are centrally located. We all know that, but it's, but that's the lens through I through which I look at it and say it is very much a priority. And 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 that's that's a great point. And actually, credit unions have been quite active because they absolutely realize that they cannot by themselves you know, offer these products and services and both on the B2B and the B2C side. And I think that's, that's one of the challenge. If I look and I'm putting my former banker um, at here, um, you know, some of the apps and services we were talking about earlier, like monitoring the credit, uh, understanding, oh, I can improve my credit report. Well, I'm not going to tell what, what, what bank I'm banking with, but I have all of that now in my banking app. So, and that's a bit like if uh, anyone is uh, watching biking, I don't watch biking, but my husband does. So by definition, I watch it. Uh, it's like when you have like three cyclists that are at the top of a race and then the peloton is coming and catching them up. The three guys at the front who made all the efforts, well, they are not compensated for that and the peloton is coming. And that's what I see in financial services today in Canada. And that's a challenge because it's a, it's a creation of wealth for entrepreneurs that is not happening. And that's creation of wealth would be recycled in our economy with new startups, new investments, employees who themselves you know, uh, created wealth. And the, the wealth that is created by the FIs is very limited while it could generate massive, massive um, uh, again, wealth for uh, individuals, and, and that's something we're, we're missing very often. Fantastic. I think, you know, this is a topic we could definitely talk about all day long and never get bored of it. Um, but I would love to open the floor to the three of you just to leave some parting thoughts with our audience. And thank you again for joining. Um, I guess I started the first one, so I'll maybe start <laughs> the last one. Uh, I, I think that we've made this point, but you know, uh, kudos to the team here for setting this up, but we, we, we cannot keep doing open banking webinars. We have to stop. 
it like it just we've done too much we spent how many years doing and having these conversations and we're, we're not much further along although again like i want to be optimistic about where we will where we will end up and i think the work that the advisory committee did on the open banking you know uh, consultation ha has been tremendous but we need to stop talking we need to start acting and i think we we will have a clear idea uh, i think in the next few months where we're going to go with open banking in this country. I think while I'm not um, expecting that there will be a big open banking uh, component in the budget, I think the federal government can at least signal that this is going to be a topic and a file that's important. They can appoint someone who will effectively become the de facto you know, organizer for the ecosystem. They might not have any you know, legislative powers, but it says like, we're serious, we're gonna move this forward. Let's really make sure all the parties are talking on a level playing field versus, you know, some being, you know, uh, in, a, in a more uh, uh, advantageous position. And um, as great as these sessions are, I'd rather we all can spend our time, you know, actually working on and, and discussing the key issues around implementation and, uh, and getting us set up to continue to propel you know, we've got a ton of great momentum in the fintech ecosystem right now uh, and we should be doing everything as a country to support that bank or non-bank so that's my piece <laughs> okay thank you um i'd like to make two points actually uh the first point is related to financial institutions we, we spoke about the the competitive uh, or lack uh, of, of, of competition in Canada, um, but the fact that international players are coming. And there is a big impact here that we need to, to, to keep in mind is that when our national financial institutions will start losing market share to big tech or foreign financial institution and big tech, obviously they're all uh, foreigner as well. What do you think is gonna happen? I mean, just in Toronto, 200,000 people are working for banks. So it creates a lot of stability and a lot of wealth creation. So if they lose market share, you can see obviously what's gonna happen, people is gonna be let off. So there is a big impact here. Um, but also there is a big impact in terms of income tax and I should I say actually a corporate tax because if now, the market share is going to foreign players. Well, that means our financial institutions are not paying as much corporate tax to Canada. So there is an impact here as well. So, so that's something again, that again, looking at a macro perspective, there is, there is a massive impact here. So that's, I would say my first point. My second point is that I start seeing a pattern. I mean, Senator Deacon mentioned the leadership in AI that we haven't been able to size and, and really benefit. We've been talking about open banking. That's obviously a missed opportunity. And I'm looking at what's happening with impact investing. It's the same thing that's happening again, where Europe is taking the lead and we're not moving. And we're going to, again, miss an opportunity to be a player and best case scenario, be a fast follower. While we have a massive financial uh, uh, services um, industry. I just don't get it, why we keep missing <laughs> opportunities here. And that's what worries me even more than just open banking is this pattern of not seeing an opportunity that is up for reach, but that we're not reaching. And Kate, what I would say is what Ben said and what Peggy said, absolutely 100% in complete agreement. But I'd add one other thing is if we do not really focus in on the missed opportunity that that we're leaving on the table i look at one at one burden that 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 our financial institutions all have and that's aml right our aml activities as costly as they are in our banks capture 0.2% of estimated criminal money flows 0.2%. Globally, this system, the, the AML activities globally work brilliantly for criminals. They're 99.8% effective for criminals and 2%, 0.2% effective, 200 basis points effective for the good guys. Well, look at what we've had happen in Canada this year. 
we had a $3.6 billion Canadian exit from St. John's, Newfoundland of a company that is a global leader in AML and fraud prevention, right? Verifin demonstrated to us that if we take a look at this issue in a different lens, not the lens that FinTrack has said here, this is how you do it. This is what you need to do. Put it out there. Let our fintech sector come up with a whole bunch of new approaches, a competitive approach to turning this issue on its head and now sell that to the world. Right? Let's turn this, let's turn these issues around. And instead of regulating by telling people how to do things, regulate by telling them the problem you want them to solve and figure out really cool, constantly changing ways that are effective and cost efficient and globally competitive. And those we are, are things we can sell to the world. So what is currently a cost to our financial institutions and a cost to, to our society and our economy and a benefit to criminals currently, what well, we can turn it around in, into something that's a new industry for Canada exporting to the world around a data-driven industry that desperately needs the AI, AI expertise that we have. So there's so many ways that we need to turn what we're doing today on its head. And we need our financial institutions to start to embrace this challenge because if they do, they are gonna be global leaders. Thanks for holding this. Yes, thank you for joining us. And that was some fantastic food for thought for sure. Um, Peggy, Senator Deacon, Ben, I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank you again for joining us. It was definitely very interesting and really hope to keep these conversations going. And as Ben said, you know, more action, less panels, maybe. <laughs> um, on less that panels. note, <laughs> except for this one, this one was pretty okay. Um, <laughs> On that note, we'd love to hand it over to JF from our Montreal office just to close us out today. Thank you, Kate. Uh, just really one minute to thank all the attendees today. Thank you for joining us. And uh, thank you, Senator Deacon, Peggy Van der Plasch, Ben Harrison. Thank you for this great discussion. I agree with all of you that we need more action than, than discussion. So let's look forward to it. Um, very quickly, our fintech group will organize webinars like this one on a more regular basis. The next one in May will be on diversity in fintech or the importance of diverse, diversity in fintech. And we will organize additional webinars in the fall on blockchain and also payment. So we look forward to uh, having you joining us as well. Thank you so much, everyone.